Broadcasting live from the North Fulton Business Radio X studio, it's time for To Your Health with Dr. Jim Morrow. To Your Health is brought to you by Morrow Family Medicine, an award-winning primary care practice, which brings the care back to health care. Hello, once again, welcome back to To Your Health. We're glad that you've chosen to join us and to listen to this episode. It's getting towards Christmas time in 2021, and I believe that I have caught my producer, John Ray, on vacation today. He's at home in his very well-decked-out home studio. John, you got the heat turned on in there. You're wearing a vest and stuff. You look like you're freezing to death. What's going on? I'm getting old and my blood's getting thinner, so that's (laughs) I I don't know what else to tell you other than that. I hear you. I suggest you gain 50 pounds and the insulation will keep you warm all the, all year round. Mm, so that's that's a, a prescription I like. So yeah, that's a, that's a great solution for that. Let me tell you. <laughs> so I am here in my office studio, <clears throat> excuse me. And John's, like I said, in his home studio. And uh, we're very blessed this afternoon to be uh, having a guest with us to talk about a subject that I think is important to an awful lot of people. And before we do that though, as I have done most often, I want to talk a little bit about COVID and what's changed and what's around about COVID right now. And of course, the thing right now is Omicron. Everybody's talking about Omicron. sounds like it ought to be a a song in a Greek play or something. But at any rate, we are now faced with yet another change in the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID. And this variant is rapidly taking over as the most common cause of COVID in the U S I saw a statistic yesterday. That's not accurate today. That said that 67% of new cases in America are now Omicron. And so it wasn't, it wasn't two weeks ago. It was in South Africa and they didn't know when it would be here. And now all of a sudden it is here and, and very, very common. And most of the cases are, uh, are milder. It's, it's probably more contagious than the other versions of the virus, but uh, most of the cases seem to be milder at this point. Of course, mild cases can become a lot worse cases if you're at risk, if you're susceptible, if you're immunosuppressed and so forth. So it's still a tremendous threat to an awful lot of people. The good news is the the mRNA vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer, are looking really good at preventing serious disease and death from infections with Omicron, as well as the other variants so far of this virus. And it's an important distinction that I want to make about the changes in this virus. I think it's very important to do that. What we're seeing as this virus changes, these are not mutations. Genetic code mutates. And that's not what's happening here. The genetic code of this virus is the same in every one of these variants. What's changing is the protein sequence that makes up the spike protein of the virus, which is what causes your immune reaction, immune reaction and so forth. It's where it attaches to the cells and that kind of thing. And this virus is changing in that regard, but it's not mutating. Viruses are not alive. They're composed of nothing but protein and genetic material, whether it's DNA or RNA. But there's nothing else there. You can't kill a virus because they're not alive. You can destroy it, but you can't kill it. They're just pieces of genetic code and what's called amino acids. And amino acids are the small substances that when you line them up and connect them in a certain sequence, form protein molecules. And in the case of the virus, we're talking about the spike protein. <clears throat> and I doubt there's anybody breathing that hadn't heard about the spike protein. So when you hear people talk about mutations, I guess the most polite way to say it is they're not informed correctly. And this is probably splitting hairs, but I, I personally think that it's important for people to understand that this virus is not mutating. It's just having some changes in the amino acid sequence and the spike protein And that has to do with how well or how poorly it can attach to your mucous membranes and the cells and that kind of thing and get in, cause a problem and cause an infection. None of these changes have made it resistant to the mRNA vaccines to this point. Now, until the end of time, this virus is going to be here and 
you have to believe that until the end of time is going to be changing. So I don't know if we're going to have to go through the Greek alphabet, alphabet multiple times or what they'll do. I'm glad I'm not in charge of naming these things, but this is something we just have to get used to. And I want to mention very quickly about treatments. Some people still are trying to drag me into an argument about treatments on social media. And just this week, I got into this discussion. I do love it, quote unquote, when people say to me, I got COVID and I took hydroxychloroquine and it cured me. Well, I know people that got COVID and ate sweet potatoes and they didn't die and they got well. So did sweet potatoes cure them? Well, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. So just because you or somebody you know took some substance and did not die, that does not mean that substance works against COVID-19, against SARS-CoV-2. It doesn't mean that. I know people who got COVID and chewed bubble gum and didn't die. I mean, it's just, you can go on and on and on. Go back to my video, John, on Facebook a year ago, seems like, about driving an F-150. You know, at that time, I can't say it now because I've had COVID. But at the time, I said, I drive an F-150, and I hadn't had COVID. And I think if you don't want to get COVID, you need to get you an F-150. I guess if I got COVID in August. I guess Ford F-150 causes COVID now. We know that, right? (laughs) The same logic. Exactly. Yeah. So I've just, sometimes I just get to the end of my rope and, you know, I'm just going to let Darwin sort that out for a lot of those people. And if you don't understand that reference, then you're making my point anyway. So that's a COVID update. Omicron's here. It's going to be here. Get a vaccine. The bottom line is get a vaccine, get a booster. And just to continue for just a second, get a booster. But in about a year or even maybe even less, we're not going to be calling that a booster because we're going to realize that this vaccine is a three shot series. You're really not done until you get that third one. If you're talking about an MRNA vaccine. And I I think we're going to find also that the MRNA vaccines are the predominant ones because of a multitude of reasons, Uh, but you need that third one. So get that third vaccine injection, please. Now the introduction and the music says that I am with Mora Family Medicine and I was for 10 years. And most people know now that the end of last year, beginning of this year, uh, I sold the business to Village Medical Uh, I feel like I kind of merged with them because it's been a mutual kind of thing. But in fact, they are in charge and this practice is now Village Medical. Uh, We have offices in Cumming and Milton still, as we did. We have added a new doctor. We're tickled to death about that. Thank you very much, Village Medical, for finding a new doctor. She's an Alpharetta, uh, uh, not resident, but she's from Alpharetta originally. Uh, Dr. Tiffany Edwards, and she's in our Milton office four days a week. And I think if you're looking for a doctor in the Milton area, you would love Tiffany. She's fantastic and very well educated and has had a a nice, not too long career because she's a lot younger than I am um, in medicine. And I think you would really appreciate her. So if you're looking for a new physician, you might check out Dr. Tiffany Edwards in our Milton location. Now, to get down to the reason for being here today and for you listening in, and again, I do appreciate it, I wanted to talk today about Alzheimer's. And in doing so, uh, John Ray, our producer, was uh, good enough and lucky enough, frankly, to come up with a guest who knows what we need to hear about Alzheimer's disease. And our guest is Miss Mary Caldwell with the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, Mary is a gerontologist who has a multiple physician uh, area experience in multiple uh, professional areas in this regard. She has been dealing with this kind of thing for a long time. She was just telling me off air that she works with patients and their families to develop care plans and understand disease. And we're just very excited to, to have you here with us today, Mary. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Jim. I am happy to be here and happy to talk about this subject because you're right. It's important. Well, it is, and it's getting more and more important. Uh, the population is getting older. Uh, here in Forsyth County, where I am, 
The population is absolutely older. We probably have as the highest percentage. I think we do have the highest percentage of people over the age of 65 is anywhere in Georgia. And there's a good reason for that. It's a great place to live. But we are seeing more and more people who, at a minimum, have concerns about their memory and at a maximum already have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. So if if you would, and I'm just going to jump right in with this, if you would yeah. talk some about the difference between Let's start with the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia in general. Right. So I think the best way to uh, think of this is close your eyes and think of an umbrella. And that umbrella would represent uh, dementia. Dementia is a cluster of symptoms. Or, you know, so you may have some memory loss. You may have some problems organizing. You see changes And there are, frankly, just lots of different symptoms under this umbrella um, of dementia. But then you look for the cause, the causation, and hope to make a diagnosis, if possible. And one of those diagnoses, in fact, the most common diagnosis for this host of symptoms is called Alzheimer's disease. That simply means that what is causing the changes in the brain can be attributed to um, biomarkers in the cerebrospinal fluid. Those biomarkers are tau tangles and beta amyloid plaque. And so if you have these symptoms and these biomarkers are found by a lumbar puncture and or there are some areas of the brain on a PET scan that show a de- decline or atrophy, then a physician can say with a surety that you have Alzheimer's disease. Um, So that's the first most common cause of dementia. The second is vascular. So to answer your question, Alzheimer's is a type of dementia. And the the differentiating factor is the reason you have the dementia. And I think that's an important thing to understand. Correct. People will say to me, I have Alzheimer's, but they didn't say I had dementia or, you know, I have dementia, but, but thank God it's not Alzheimer's, you know, Alzheimer's is not like the worst dementia. I don't think there's any best or worst or worst dementia. Um, It's just the stigma attached to that name Alzheimer's that has developed over the past, what would you say? 50 years has, is really, really impacting, uh, and causing, if you will, if you ask me, a barrier, a resistance to people going to their primary care physician and saying, hey, I've got this concern, doc. Um, so hopefully we're working to, to uh, affect that stigma. And when people have, and people my age, I'm 67, people my age come in and a lot of times they're having some memory loss, but they just have memory loss. Right. And so you mentioned... Uh, problems other than the memory loss problems, organizing and so forth problems, maybe with language and that kind of Mm -hmm. thing. Um, Is there, there is no test still though uh, for people just with memory loss. Isn't that right? Yeah. Jim, since um, dementia, I like to say that dementia is a, um, it's a physical there are physical causes for the symptoms of dementia. So there is a physical disease that presents itself psychologically, you know, and, and like most chronic diseases in aging, you know, this is a complicated diagnostic process. Many physicians are just not familiar with it and they don't feel comfortable diagnosing it because, you know, you and I know, and maybe other people on this call or listening to this podcast would know, but diagnosis is not like, okay, let me take your blood. I'm going to put your blood in this little machine and it's going to pop out a report and tell me what's wrong with you. That's not how it works. It comes down to judgment on the, uh, on the part of the physician. And this is why I like to see a whole team of people be involved in a diagnostic process like the physician, then a neurologist, maybe even a geria psychologist, certainly a care manager like me, you know. Um, so I'm not sure if I answered your question. You did. You did. <laughs> okay. And before we went on the air, we were talking also about the difference in dementia 
and what's not quite yet dementia, the mild cognitive impairment, mild thought, right. mild thought impairment. Um, tell our listeners, if you will, why the mild cognitive impairment is important and what's important to do once you know that that's going on. Right. Well, this is a very exciting field. It is an exciting time to be a gerontologist because uh, you mentioned earlier the boomers, you know, I'm 58. So I'm technically a boomer because I was born in 63, but I really don't feel like a boomer. I feel maybe like in between one or the other. But um, anyway, we got, you know, we're aging, we're living longer. um, And that's what I hope this, you know, that we can do in this conversation is just calm people down a bit about the risk for dementia and ensure them that there are things that they can do right now in their daily lives to reduce the risk. But um, so 25 years ago, when people were diagnosed with Alzheimer's, I'm just going to say Alzheimer's, but I would like for you to understand that I mean all types of dementia. Um, Again, Alzheimer's being the most common. So People were being diagnosed definitely in mid to late stages. I mean, you know, it, I mean, gosh, Jim, I want to say it was 30 years ago that there was a um, the substance that you can uh, get your MRI with or your PET scan with was um, was invented. So we really haven't been in this for a very long time. So things are rapidly changing. Um, And we're getting people in offices, more and more people in their physician offices saying, hey, I've got these symptoms. What's wrong with me? Or is there anything wrong? You know, that just begins the process. And uh, now we have an abundance of a diagnosis called mild cognitive impairment because people are getting in there. Their symptoms are documented. However, it's in such an early stage that we don't know what's causing the changes yet. We don't know what the physical, some people uh, um, opt to go ahead and get a lumbar puncture at that time. Some clinics are doing that. You can definitely find a neurologist to do that with um, who's, who can help you with that. But the reason you would want to do that is to know, do I have the beta amyloid plaque and tau tangles that are the markers for Alzheimer's or not? Right. So at least you could say this MCI is most likely due to Alzheimer's. Right. And so then if, go ahead. So if, if it is Alzheimer's, if you do the, the spinal tap and you find the amyloid and it is Alzheimer's, <clears throat> what are we going to do for them? What do we do? Well, as you know, there's a, I mean, you know, lots and lots of press around a new FDA approved drug, Aduhelm, um, Aducanumab, but the name that it's sold under is Aduhelm. But more than that, it's a window of opportunity. So you go to your doctor, you do have some symptoms, then there's going to be a number of tests run. By the way, everybody gets the wellness, the annual wellness visit from Medicare there is um, the ability to test the mini cog, do a mini cognitive on everybody. I mean, really, folks, if you're 63 and you're not getting screened for this mini cog every time you go in once a year, then you're just shooting yourself in the foot because, you know, it, people are afraid. In, a, in essence, I really think they don't want to know or they're afraid to know, afraid of a diagnosis like that. But What happens when your doctor can say, okay, we see changes. There are five domains that we look at in a cognitive um, screening. And at the end of the day, if there is a change in one or more of those over time, and you are having these symptoms, then the diagnosis might be mild cognitive impairment. If we find out that you do have beta amyloid plaque and tau tangles, then it might be MCI related to uh, Alzheimer's disease. Or if you've had, you know, severe heart problems, it might be MCI related to vascular, or they may give you a diagnosis of early stage Alzheimer's, which, you know, you can look at someone with MCI and someone with early stage any dementia and really not see any differences, really, in the way that they present. So what we want to do 
with that person is give them all the tools they need to make lifestyle changes that would benefit their brain health. We want to also give them lots of information about what increases risk. We want to try to help them get into some programming like social engagement programs that will help them preserve their cognitive reserve. And that's not just about playing Sudoku all day, right? So that's what you can do. There's really no limit to what you can't do if you find out early enough, because Jim, you know that we know what to do. We need to eat a mainly Mediterranean diet, you know, our healthy diet. We need to get some exercise every day. We need to get enough sleep. I mean, this is not just for Alzheimer's, right? right? right. Yeah, absolutely true. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem, of course, is getting people to do that. That's right. <laughs> and by the time you get to the age we're talking about, a lot of them are unable to do some of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm willing to say most of them are so ensconced in their own everyday routine and habit and life that it's just even more difficult to get them to do that. But you it mentioned really the, the new treatment and, and treatments always baffled me because other than this new treatment, I can't pronounce the name of it. What is it again? Um, you probably saw it in the papers most recently as Aducanumab. But Aduhelm is Aduhelm. the okay. yeah Aduhelm is the drug. Yeah, the so the, that is what. Oh, it's ridiculous. We're working <laughs> um, the Alzheimer's. I'm sorry, just to be truthful, but that's the it way. Is. I am. You're right. That's why I brought it up. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, we know that, and we have um, the Alzheimer's Association is working very hard. I can assure you, always behind the scenes working mm. with all of these groups. You know, the FDA, the um, Biotech, uh, biotech, or that's the company, right? That, um, mm. yeah, um, because we think that this drug should be covered by Medicare and Medicaid, okay. of course. So, if you take that, the newest drug out of the equation for a minute, because we don't know that much about how it's going to. Yeah, work I can speak a little bit about it. We are <laughs> people are taking it in Georgia. They are true, yeah. but and if, have you, if, been you for a while. if you think about the others. We have the same four medicines that we've had for what the last twenty years. Yeah, the cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, so, gosh, I'm not a scientist. Well, I'm a social scientist, uh, <laughs> but I'm not a physician or an RN. Um, so, I'm not going to speak to the real sciencey part of this. I don't think people really want to hear that anyway. There, the medicines that are that have been being prescribed, and there's four of them, are for the optimal performance of the brain. So without getting too specific, um, one of the most detrimental things in Alzheimer's are, that causes these changes in people is the connection and the communication between the synapses in the brain. Um, I mean, it's how we remember. It's how we talk. It's how everything, you know, it's what runs our ship. And so these medications are support brain function. To really simplify it, I said, people will say, well, I've been taking that Aricept and I haven't Aricept or Namendo or, you know, any of the other ones. And I haven't, and there are some generics as well. I haven't, I don't feel anything. I haven't felt right. seen a change or haven't felt anything. I've even had some folks report their primary care physician said, you know what, just don't take it. Well, I don't recommend that. That would be like saying, let's not change the oil in your car anymore because it seems to be running fine today, right? Um, right. Do you agree with me there? Is that horrible that I tell people that? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think it's a bad analogy at all. That's not horrible. Yeah. So it encourages people to, you know, why would you stop doing something that's not hurting you if it is potentially helping? But, but granted, those things were developed at, you know, even if they were just developed yesterday, there have been lots of ground covered in just the 20, past 24 hours, because never fear, there are researchers, scientists, doctors, patients all over the globe, just working their darndest to get us some answers, because everybody hates this disease. That's one thing we all share. That's very true. That's very true. So, 
once your loved one or yourself, once you're diagnosed with Alzheimer's or any other form of dementia, what should people anticipate happening? What's the, the usual routine over the next six to months to 48 to 48 months? What, what do people see happening overall? <laughs> Sometimes it's a sad story, Jim. So maybe we should talk more about what we would like to see happen, you know, or what people can expect. We okay. do have an amazing uh, resource on our website and I can share my email with anybody on this call. And if you want to email me, I'm happy to answer any specific questions or talk to you. I mean, I'm just on fire about it and passionate about it. So I'm happy to do that. We but we have, a, <laughs> yeah, we have some, uh, some guidelines for a dignified diagnosis. We have a brochure, we have a program. And so, you know, we can definitely talk about that. But what you want to do is probably get a referral from your PCP. He can do or she can do. The PCP can perform the original test like we talked about, the mini cog and the wellness exam. If there is an indication that there's further uh, information needed, then, you know, you may be referred to a neurologist who will then it's going to be a battery of tests. It just is. And people get frustrated with that. Um, but maybe you can help me explain to people again that a diagnosis is much more um, complicated and based on the discretion of the physician, right? It's a little bit like an onion. It is. Yeah, you know, you have to just peel things back till you get to what the, the bottom line is. And sometimes you get stopped before you get to the bottom line and just don't have a specific answer. There are a lot of things that happen to people in dementia kind of is one of them that we don't always know the cause for it. And people want to know that they want to know that. And sometimes it just happens. That's right. If that's your mother or your father that we're talking about, that's a difficult thing to, to accept sometimes. It definitely can be. And people don't understand the, the symptom and the pain actual pain, like physical pain, loss of uh, endurance, loss of energy, that sort of thing that comes with one of these diseases that you can't see, you know? Um, And so you want to, I I just would like to talk about Georgia memory net for a minute. Okay. Are you, are you familiar with Georgia memory net? Minimally. Okay. So, um, There are five clinics in the state of Georgia. They're all related to teaching medical uh, colleges and research hospitals. So, and teaching hospitals. Um, Emory is uh, is the administrative entity of the Georgia Memory Nets, but it's paid for by the taxpayers of this state. It was, uh, we really, really are doing a great job in Georgia. We're always trying to do a better job, but I would like, for people to leave this this radio show with at least the knowledge that um, they live in a state where we really are go getters in this area of aging and of dementia as well. So um, the Georgia Memory Net, you have two appointments. They're just diagnostic clinics, um, so any physician in the state can refer to a Georgia Memory Net, and their patient will go and they will have extensive testing. They will have an MRI. Then they will have a follow-up appointment. They are connected to the area agencies on aging and they are connected to us in this process. And then at the end of the day, all the records are sent back to their primary care physician. And hopefully they've gotten that accurate diagnosis. They've gotten a care plan going. And this sets you on the right path to live well with dementia. And that's the that's the whole goal that you want, because you're not going to die tomorrow of dementia. You know, you may not die of dementia. You may be 84 and be diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. So what then? Do you just not treat it because you're 84? No, because today's 84 was not yesterday's 84, you know? That's That's absolutely true. So you mentioned uh, some things, but what are some of the other resources? And and by the way, you said you'd offer up your email and I will get it at the end. I can promise you. Okay. Probably make you regret that, but we're going to do that. We also have a Uh, 24-7 helpline. 
Sorry. Well, there you go. That's what I was going to ask. What other yeah. resources, what other helps out there? So tell us about that too. Yeah. Well, at the association, our resources are one of our best resources is the 24 seven helpline. So we have, uh, we have uh, cl- licensed clinicians there who can perform care consultation at any time of day and night. And then we also have consultants that can talk about anything from a broad concern to uh, I can't get mama to relax and, li- and lay down and rest tonight. What do I do? It's wonderful to be able to call them at 1130 at night and have somebody really compassionate and knowledgeable on the phone. Um, so our consultants really our helpline consultants really are colleagues to us we don't all live in the same city no but uh, we work as a team and so there's that we also have support groups virtual and in person we have education classes uh, live webinars um, virtual and and live um And then we work with partners all over the state to provide education in many different forms and to support people who have a diagnosis. I conduct uh, physician referrals myself from the five memory nets and many clinicians in the state. Well, I think that's that's just us. I think it's I think it's very safe to say that the majority of people don't know about any of that. that That's right. And, that's right. and so I, I think that's wonderful to hear. I'm, I'm glad myself to know that I can refer people probably to your website or whatever. So if you will tell us how people can get in touch with uh, the Alzheimer's association and, and people so that they can look into some of this information. Right. So our helpline phone number, I'm going to tell you what that is. It is an 800 number, but again, We all work as colleagues, and that number is 800-272-3900. Again, that's 800-272-3900. So you can call that number. I'd also like to just invite anyone who's a member of uh, a business or an organization to call that number or email me. And one of the things I know people don't know about this is if you've got 15 or more people in a group who would just like to learn, we have a number of education programs and we will work with your organization to either come to you in person or host a Zoom education. And we will be there to do the education and then answer questions. It's just a really great way. I think a lot of uh, human resource folks should be doing that because, you know, the number of us who are in a sandwich generation predicament, uh, you're working full time, but you're caregiving for not only your grandchildren or your children, but your parents and aunts. And yeah, and I don't know anybody who's not dealing with dementia in some way. Right. Yeah. Whether it's their family or friends or people mm-hmm. they know, neighbors and so forth. It's, it's, it's everywhere and we're all going to face it. So let me get your email if you don't mind. Sure. My email is M as in Mary, L as in Lee, Caldwell, C-A-L-D-W-E-L-L. So ML Caldwell at A-L-Z dot O-R-G. Wonderful. That's great. Uh, and if people... I see, I see this a fair amount people who have had loved ones that had dementia of some sort and they may have passed and it made an impact or had an impact on their lives and they want to work and try to help people like yourself and maybe try to volunteer and do something. Is there a way they can do that with the Alzheimer's association? <laughs> oh yes. Oh, please. <laughs> I thought Listen, you know, yes, we are a nonprofit as you know. Um, uh, one of the many things people don't know about us is that we are behind the U.S. government and the Chinese government only in funding research globally. So, um, you know, we really are fighting the good fight as hard as we can. We we put more than 80 percent of donations into all of those things, including research and lots of researchers right here in the state of Georgia at Emory, at Georgia State. 
at UGA, at Kennesaw, you know, at Statesboro. So uh, just so much to know. That being said, yes, we need you. If you have a passion and would like to become a community educator, we train folks to do what I just said, go into these communities and um, and and present an education. We have several different volunteer opportunities, and you can find about that on our website, call our helpline, email me. Our volunteers are our teammates, really. And I think is we offer not just something very important to do in the community in a way to add value to your community, but we also offer sort of a social home for someone who's looking to do something meaningful if they're retired, right? There is a brain trust of retirees right now. Yeah, people that that need something to do, they need a a meaning to their day. And I think this is a, a great thing. I'm glad to know about it. Very glad to know about it. So be- okay. before we close, anything else you want to say about the work that you're doing or the disease that you're helping to fight? I want to say that it's very important if you have a loved one or you yourself have concerns about any changes in cognition, please don't let fear keep you from talking to your primary care physician about it. Know that there are five clinics in the state that you can go to to get just a great diagnosis if you don't have a neurologist nearby or in your hometown and know that we're here. We welcome you to become involved with us in any capacity. And thank you. It's been really fun. Well, you know, I I appreciate that. And I I preach to my patients every day, multiple times, not to say the five most dangerous words in the English language, which are maybe it will go away. (laughs) <laughs> and I, I think if people will keep that in mind, if they have symptoms themselves or if they have loved ones, they think might just don't sit around thinking maybe it'll change. Just get yeah. it checked, get things checked out. Yeah. And if I have one more second as a yeah. gerontologist, I will add this. Look, to be completely honest with you, at the end of almost every day, I say, oh, gosh, I didn't exercise again today. Now, I'm a gerontologist. I know better. I know that if I could just get on that treadmill for 20 minutes a day, it improves your health by leaps and bounds. Not only that, improves your mind. You know, after you work out, you just get this burst of energy. You can feel the brain loves physical activity. Now, I made the confession because what I'd like to do is let people know You know, it pays to have a healthy diet. I don't want you to never eat birthday cake or have, uh, you know, potato chips again. Um, But if you only knew how directly affected your brain is by the food you eat, then you would definitely try to eat well every day. Exercise, get enough sleep. Nothing in the world is worth stress. It's just not. They're not that important. Let it go. You're not going to do all those things every day. Some days you're not going to accomplish those things. But on the days that you do, it matters. And just the small adjustments we make to our life matter so much. Right, Jim? It does. It's no longer a question whether you're going to live for a long time. The question (laughs) is, what is the quality of that time going to be? Are you going to develop a chronic illness and aging as most people who are unhealthy do by the time they're what, 60? Easily. Easily. Usually it starts even earlier. Um, Or are you just going to every day wake up with that intention to live as healthy as you can because your body is going to be around for a long time? (laughs) And so far they're not giving out new bodies, right? I'm going to have to be in this one. (laughs) They are. I'll be the first one in line. Well, Mary, I I really do appreciate this time. Thank you so much. And I'm going to go back to John Ray, our producer, and say, John, that's what we've got on Alzheimer's right now. Yeah, this was awesome. I mean, Mary, uh, let me echo Jim and just say thank you so much for taking the time to come educate uh, uh, not just us two guys, but our our audience out there. Um, And and 
uh, you've been terrific. So thank you. And thanks to you, your colleagues at the Alzheimer's Association for the great work you do. Well, thank you. We're happy to come back anytime. There's always something new to talk about. Thank you. Very good. All right. So for now, that's to your help.